Koto, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good 3 a.m. in the middle of the night. Hopefully that covers all eventualities wherever you are in the globe at the moment. Welcome to all alumni and friends of the University of Auckland to this, the fifth in our series of inspiring talks, Raising the Bar, Auckland, Home Edition. My name is Mark Bentley. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Development, and it's my pleasure to welcome you, or indeed welcome you back if you've tuned in to some of our other talks. For the new view viewers amongst you, let me quickly explain that for the last three years, we've enjoyed raising the bar on one spectacular night in Auckland by bringing 20 of our most thought-provoking academics from the university into the city's bars to give great talks. Sounds like a recipe for disaster, but it's actually been great fun. For a long time, we've been wanting to take raising the bar to a bigger audience, uh, mainly because it was so much fun, but it took a pandemic to stimulate the creative thinking to bring it online this year. So the series has six great speakers over six weeks, and today is the turn of Professor Richard Easter. Now Richard is really New Zealand's own Carl Sagan, and he'll take us into space, boldly going where no University of Auckland audience has ever gone before. And your MC for this journey is Dr. Nicholas Rattenbury, a senior lecturer in the Department of Physics. Now Nicholas will introduce Richard a bit more fully than I have, and he'll also help you to ask your questions later on. But let me first just give you a couple of quick points about Nick. First, he's the current president of the Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand. So you're on very safe hands for this journey. Second, he's a devoted home brewer. So in true raising the bar spirit, I suggest we all pop around to his place for a pint afterwards. Hope that's okay with you, Nick. Absolutely, thank you, Mark. Now my haere mai, welcome to Raising the Bar Auckland Home Edition. We are lucky to have with us Professor Richard Easter, head of the physics department at the University of Auckland. Today, tonight, this morning, at whatever local time you're currently experiencing, Richard will be talking to us about the universe itself, its origin, its evolution, and its fate. His talk is entitled, Simple Questions, Some with Simple Answers, Big Bangs and Black Holes. Richard Easter is a professor and head of department of physics at the University of Auckland. Born in New Zealand, Richard worked in Japan and the United States for 16 years after finishing his PhD at the University of Canterbury. He was a professor of physics and astronomy at Yale University, returning to New Zealand at the end of 2011. Richard's research is at the interface of particle physics and astronomy, focusing on the nature of dark matter and the origin and evolution of the universe. Before I hand over to Richard, a few housekeeping items. The Q&A function at the bottom of your screen is live. Please submit any questions you have for Richard at any time. We'll be monitoring those as we go along and we'll uh, pose the, as many of these as we can to Richard. You'll be able to upvote any questions you really like coming from other people. So take a look down the bottom of your screen, the Q&A button, give it a click, and then post your questions in the box which pops up. And now, without any further ado from me, over to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Nick. I really appreciate the, um, the intro, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, this afternoon, today, um, uh, potentially tomorrow, depending on March, you know, yesterday, depending on which uh, time zone you happen to be in. So I want to begin uh, with an experiment, and the experiment is this. Um, I want you either to do this, or if you're just feeling shy to imagine doing this, I want you to hold your hands in front of you, maybe a foot, uh, maybe 30 centimeters apart, depending on whether you're in the United States or, um, or in a metricated country. And I want you to ask, what is it that lies between your hands? And so one of the things between your hands is obviously um, there's air that, that is between your hands. Um, but imagine now that you're in space, that your hands are still the same distance apart. Um, what is it that um, is between your, uh, between your hands when you're in a deep vacuum? And ultimately, once you take everything away, every material object that we can think of, once you remove everything from the scene, the thing that remains is space. The thing that says that this hand is not in the same place as this hand is that there is space between the two of them. If you move one of your hands, then time tells you when your hand is at a particular place. The words space and time are deceptively simple. Uh, when you sit and think and ask, you know, what is space? What is time? Uh, you find yourself kind of perched at the end of the edge of a deep and um, potentially bottomless rabbit hole that you can, you can vanish down. 
But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to take a peek down that rabbit hole and see what it is we can see and see how changing ideas of space and time reflect uh, physicists changing ideas about the way that the, um, that the world works. So one thing that people have done or might have done is to have played a game. Uh, that game might be battleships, it might be drafts or checkers or chess. You might have filled in a um, crossword. You might have done a Sudoku, 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 Sudoku puzzle. All of those things um, live on a grid. And the key thing that all of those things have in common is that even if the person that you're playing with gets kind of super upset with the course of the game and flips the table upside down, the grid itself almost always comes through the experience unchanged and un unaltered by the experience. The game is played on a grid, but the grid itself is not part of the game. The grid does not change. So if nothing happens to the grid, that grid is operating in something the same way that space operates for somebody who's learning physics at high school. And it's probably true the way that physicists imagined space working up until the beginning of the 20th century. For physicists, space was something um, that tell us where things happen, um, but nothing happens to space. Time is something that tells us when, thing hap when things happen, but nothing happens to time. Ultimately, uh, these ideas can be traced back to um, thinkers like Isaac Newton and Rene Descartes. Uh, Rene Descartes gave us the Cartesian coordinates, the idea of a grid, you know, with X and Y axes, the sort of things uh, that kids who don't particularly like math are tormented with um, at school. Um, but also the sort of idea that we can specify where something happens by its coordinates. So we can give a set of numbers that is the address of, an, a, point, of a point in space. And if we add time to that, it also tells us when something is happening. The thing that Newton adds to this is the idea of we have a description of motion that tells us that something is moving through space at this moment, this thing is at this point, at this moment it's at this point, at this moment it's at this point. We can talk about a velocity, how fast is it changing its position. We can talk about an acceleration, how fast is the velocity changing. Newton invented calculus to help him make sense of physics. He also invented or discovered or created or wrote down uh, what we now now call Newton's three laws of motion. And Newton's laws of motion do the job of um, tying um, the world together. And so what, that does, what Newton did was by explaining gravity. If something moves, if a planet is orbiting a star, um, if the, uh, um, the moon orbits the Earth, those things are moving in a curved line as they make their way through, um, through space. And that curved line in Newton's world tells us that if something is changing its direction of motion, it's because something is forcing it to do that. Or as Newton would say, a force is acting on that object. If a force is acting on an object, then uh, we can ask, you know, what is the nature of that force? What is its mathematical properties? And Newton described and pretty much intuited a formula that described the force of gravity. And the thing that was special about what Newton had done as he said that when the force of gravity acts, it's the same thing that makes an apple fall from the tree, that makes a ball um, rise into the air and then um, um, fall to the ground or change its, change its direction of motion, that makes the planets go around, this, um, go around the sun. In Newton's time, there was a distinction um, between the heavens, which were seen as sacred, between the earth that was seen as profane. And what Newton did was to say that the same rules that applied on the earth also applied in the heavens, that he joined these two things together. In some sense, that he uh, created a theory of everything that operated um, not today as we imagine a, 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 some complex form of particle physics, but he'd been taken these apparently disparate ideas and he showed that these disparate phenomena were able to be explained uh, with the same rules and the same um, explanatory tools. He joined the ground to the sky, he joined, um, joined heaven to earth in his explanations. In doing this, he was necessarily relying on this idea of space and this idea of time as a thing that allowed us to keep track of where things were happening and when things were happening. But for Newton, nothing particularly special happens to space and time as the events um, play out inside them. So this is the idea that physicists would have um, developed of space and time uh, when, uh, you know, when we learn physics at school. It's um, probably close to the idea that a professional physicist would have had 
of space and time if we go back to the beginning of the 20th century. So what I want to do is I want to take us 250 years forward from Newton. And the time now is 1915. I want you to imagine that it's 1915 and that you are Albert Einstein. There's a lot going on in your life. Uh, you're already famous within physics. In a few months, in the space of a few months in 1905, in um, what historians of science came to call your Annus Mirabilis, your year of miracles, you provided the clinching proof that atoms are real. You laid a key foundation of quantum mechanics, which would be the thing that you did that won you the Nobel Prize a few years after 1915. Um, and most important for um, tonight's talk, today's talk, this morning's talk, this evening's talk, um, starting from the ideas of electromagnetism, which had been worked out in the 19th century in the 1800s and written down in detail for the first time in the 1860s. Starting from that mathematical description of electromagnetism, you started to tease out ideas of time and space that showed that a moving clock would apparently run more slowly than one that was standing still. That the distances, um, you know, if a meter rod um, comes flying past you at some large fraction of the speed of light, whatever that might happen, we don't know that that rod would be perceptibly shorter than the same rod would do if it was um, sitting next to you. This is the basis of Einstein's special theory of relativity. And he gave us a different picture of space and time. He gave us a picture where space and time became joined together into a single object called space-time. And where things look different depending on how you are moving. And the way things change depending on how you move is what physicists in general call a theory of relativity. And this is where this phrase comes from. How do we move from our perspective that we might have um, in a car moving down the highway as opposed to someone standing by the side of the road? How do they match measurements? You know, if you're in a car, the car moving next to you, you're both going at the same speed. Um, neither of you appears to be moving. If you're standing by the side of the road, both of those cars are going quite quickly. How do we match between those two frames. It's a theory of relativity that takes us from one of those frames to the other. What um, special relativity does for us is it tells us that time and space can change their appearance as we change our motion. But space-time itself is still something that is, in, um, is unchanged by the experiences of what happens inside us. Now, this was 10 years in the past. Uh, you're now in, um, in Munich. Um, and there's a lot to know about you. You are a, um, a terrible husband and a lousy father. Uh, your first wife, um, Maleva, is with your kids in Zurich, and you are now living with your second cousin, Elsa, who, you, who will come to be your second wife. Uh, you're in Berlin in 1915, which is the, um, a city in the heart of a global empire that's um, locked in the world's first uh, worldwide mechanized war. Um, many of your colleagues are going to be deeply involved with the war effort. Uh, the chemist, uh, Fritz Haber, one of the most famous um, and influential chemists in history, recruited you um, to your job at Berlin, and he's spending all his time uh, leading the development of poison gas that he will personally oversee its use in the Battle of Ypres. Um, his wife, Clara, who's a friend of yours, many of your families will be so disgusted at this turn of events that she shoots herself with her husband's service revolver. Uh, like Haber, uh, you're Jewish. Uh, but unlike Haber, you're a pacifist and you have not converted to Christianity. Puts you somewhat on the outside in Berlin in 1915. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of teaching. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a job where you're free to pursue your own interests. And so what you do is you spend your time trying to fit Newton's idea of gravity and your new ideas about space and time uh, into the new ideas about space and time that you developed a decade ago. So in the middle of all of this turmoil, you're trying to pursue this journey of the mind um, to overturn the ideas of time and space that Newton uh, first, um, first really cooked up for us uh, 250 years ago. Now, Newton saw gravity as a force. As I said, the first law of motion is nothing changed until it's forced to. Einstein was asking himself how it was that gravity worked. What makes gravity actually happen? And so physicists are a little like children. Um, and so there's always that moment with a child when you say, but why? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do this? And you always give reasons. And finally, you have to come back to, well, because I said so, or because that's just the way it is. Or yes, you know, you have to go to bed because, because that's, just, that's just what kids do. And in some ways, the job of physics is to move, um, you know, as many but whys back in the chain as we possibly can. 
So before there was Newton, before there were organized understandings of the planets, you might not have had a good, ex good explanation for why it was the planets move in the sky the way they do, but you can say, well, this is how they move. Why did they do that? We don't know. Well, Newton gave you one but why deeper. Why do they move like that? Well, they move like that because of my force of gravity. How? But why is there gravity? Well, Newton didn't have a good answer to that, and he would have to say, well, it just seems to be that there is a thing called gravity. So the picture that Einstein came to is that space itself or space-time itself is curved and warped by the presence of massive objects inside of it. And the answer that Einstein, or the vision that Einstein has is that everything moves in space-time. If we sit still in space, we're still moving through time at the speed of one second per second. So nothing in space-time can be considered to be truly at rest. Everything is in motion. Um, if we're, we're sitting in space and nothing is changing where we're sitting, we would imagine that we were moving in a straight line in space-time. In space-time, the time direction is typically vertically. We would imagine we just simply moved vertically up the page. But when you add gravity to the picture that bends the, um, the, the fabric of space-time itself, when you try and move in a, space, a straight line in a curved space-time, you find yourself moving in a curve in space. You think you're following a straight line, you're doing as best to go as straight as you can, but the path that you travel in space is curved. And so because massive objects curve the fabric of space, we perceive that curvature as the force of gravity when we use uh, Newton's language to describe gravity. But really, from the perspective of Einstein, gravity is communicated by the warping and bending of space. So that warping is what we call gravity. And it might sound like semantics, but it's this idea that is at the heart of the general theory of relativity. So let's just think about this for a second, maybe several seconds. Um, one picture of this that's used a lot is the idea of space as a rubber sheet which is stretched by the presence of a massive object. So imagine a kid sitting on a trampoline rolling a marble. You get it just right, and you roll that marble, it will travel in a circle around the kid. They've created this kind of skateboard bowl, um, you know, this dimple in the fabric of the trampoline. They roll it just right, and the marble will move in a circle. And that, in essence, is what happens if you try to roll, if the Earth or is, is um, in space, it's bent the space around it, uh, a spacecraft is in orbit around the Earth, it's moving and what it thinks is a straight line in space-time, but what we see is a curved line in space. It follows the orbit, of the, the orbit of the Earth. But now think some more. The Earth moves. The Earth moves through space, and so as the Earth moves, space must bend and stretch in order to keep up with the fact that the Earth is moving. Otherwise, there would be a dimple here where the Earth's gravitational field was, and the Earth uh, would be some, some distance away over here. And what would happen then is the Earth and its gravitational field would become disconnected from each other in the same way that Peter Pan briefly becomes disconnected from his shadow in the Disney movie. And then, you know, the idea of someone becoming disconnected from their shadow is something that can only happen in a movie, not something that can happen in real life. The idea of an object becoming disconnected from its gravitational field, again, not something we think can happen, um, can happen in real life. So what that means is that space-time is now something that can bend and stretch. It's stretched by the presence of the Earth. It snaps back as the Earth moves away. So space-time is now not just a venue when in which things happen. It's not just the chessboard on which the game plays out. It's not just the stage on which the drama happens. It's become one of the players in the game. It's become one of the actors on the stage. It responds to the motion that happens inside of it. Or as John Wheeler, a physicist um, who did a lot of work developing our understanding of the general theory of relativity in the 20th century put it, matter tells space how to curve and space tells matter how to move. And as matter moves, the curvature of space-time will change along with it. So this is a word picture that tells us what goes on in general relativity. And Einstein expressed his ideas in um, this equation here. Um, this, for me, is probably the single most beautiful equation in physics. It's the one that Einstein wrote down in 1915. And there's nothing in, a, in this equation that we would want to change. Everything in it today, um, that was 100 years ago, is as it should be today. We have no, there's no phenomena that we've seen that obviously tell us that there's something amiss uh, with what we're seeing. This is like, you know, a matchbox. You could write this equation on the back of your hand 
on a big matchbox, but it unpacks as you um, build our understanding of it, it unpacks into a cathedral that you can walk inside and you see this probably what um, for many physicists would be regarded as a single most beautiful and profound uh, creation of the human mind. So that's all well and good, but how did Einstein know that he was right? And so the first way that he knew that he was right was that he looked at the way that the planet Mercury would move around the sun in his theory of gravity, his theory of general relativity that he constructed. And for most of a hundred years, the way that Mercury moved around the sun had been bothering astronomers. And it was a tiny little itch of a bother, but Mercury is closest to the sun of all the planets. And it also has a particularly elliptical or egg shaped orbit. In Newtonian gravity, that orbit would stay, um, the, the pointy end of the egg would stay at the same place in space. But what we saw was that it was slowly, over a period of millions of years, it would make a complete trip around the sun. Some of that can be explained by the pulling of the other planets in the solar system on Mercury, but there was a tiny little bit that was left over. And when you do the calculations, so this is a calculation that we were doing typically with our fourth year students, uh, when you do this calculation, you put the numbers in and it's like, how big is the sun? How far away is Mercury from the sun? How egg shaped is it in orbit? What's the speed of light? What's the strength of gravity? You put all those numbers in there and you just see just beautifully the, 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 uh, this um, discrepancy that people have been trying to explain for years and years and years pops out of this, um, of this uh, calculation that you've done. It's just, just perfect. It's exactly the right number that you need and there's nothing that you can adjust to make it different if it hadn't worked out. Uh, the other thing that happened, or the other thing that changes, is that the bending of light. Um, Einstein predicts that light falls, that um, the passage of light moving in a straight line follows the same curve in space-time as, 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 um, as it would do if it was trying to, um, to pass, pass, um, pass through the sky. Um, when that happens, um, again, that was tested in 1919 by the British physicist um, Arthur Eddington. He leads an expedition that looks at an eclipse of the sun. And when you want to measure the bending of starlight by the sun, you have to do it at a time when the sun is blotted out of the sky. Just so it happens that it happens every now and then uh, when this moon passes in front of the sun, you can see that the stars have moved their position slightly relative to when the sun is there six months later. You come up with how much they've moved. And again, you get roughly the number that uh, Einstein predicted close enough. And at that moment, Einstein hadn't just explained an anomaly, he also made a successful prediction. And Einstein, through the 1920s, was um, a, a scientific superhero, um, a sort of Stephen Hawking crossed with Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you like. Everyone in the world knew who he was. The third thing that Einstein predicted was that time runs more slowly if you're deep in a gravitational field. And if you're right at the surface of a black hole, time would appear almost to come to a stop. Now that theory again has been tested as we've made better clocks, but it's also um, got us to the point where um, we've just used the word black hole and I haven't really, um, I've just kind of slid that one in. So the idea of a black hole, it turns out is not one that Einstein invented or not one we need a general relativity to give us. In 1783, George Mitchell, a British geophysicist, clergyman um, and thinker, sat down and thought, he said, what would happen if um, a sun, star like the sun got bigger and bigger and bigger? So let's imagine we take the sun and then we take another sun, we put it next to it, another sun, we put it next to it. And we do that until it's like 500 suns across, 500 that way, 500 that way, make a giant sphere that's 500 times as big as the sun in each direction. But, and this is the tricky part, but 500 times as big as the sun, but the same density as the sun. And the sun, we know um, its density because we know how strong its gravitational field is. We can measure how big it is. It turns out the sun has a density of about 1.4 times that of water or about the same density as honey. So if you took the sun and you replaced it with a giant sphere of honey, same size, same honey all the way through, you would have roughly the same gravitational field. You make it bigger and bigger and bigger, the speed that you need to move moving to escape the surface goes up, what we call the escape velocity. You get to that point where your sphere of honey is about five times as, uh, 500 times as big as the sun and the escape velocity at the surface of that sphere is exactly equal to the speed of light. Now in 1783, people thought it was pretty reasonable to think of light as little bullets that was fired out of glowing objects. 
And so those little bullets wouldn't be able to make it into space. They would fall back to the surface of this giant star, what, um, what Mitchell called a dark star. So not a black hole, but a dark star. And he had the same idea as astronomers do today when we think about black holes. That we can't, that nothing, no light can escape from them, but that the, um, they can betray their presence in the cosmos by their um, effect, by the effects of their gravitational field on things around them. So Einstein finished his theory at the end of 1915, he published it. In 1916, um, Karl Schwarzschild, a German scientist who joined um, the artillery, he was in hospital suffering from a rare disease and contracted um, while fighting on the Russian front, of which he eventually died. And while he was recovering, or while he was attempting to recover, he looked at Einstein's equation and he came up for the solution to those equations that describes the gravitational field of a single point mass, like just a mass, single point in the gravitational field that would be around. And what he discovered was that if you take that solution, there is a boundary that once you cross it, you can't come back, what we call the horizon. And then in the case of the sun, rather than imagining making the sun bigger and bigger and bigger, we take the sun and we imagine making it smaller and smaller and smaller. Once the sun gets smaller than three kilometers across, it's inside of its horizon. Once the earth gets a few centimeters across, it would be inside of its own horizon. We know no mechanism that will make either the sun or the earth shrink that much, but we can do this as a thought experiment. And so that gives us what we call a vacuum solution. There's no mass left, it's vanished behind the horizon, just empty space and a one-way barrier. We can cross it, but we can never cross back. So there's no way of exploring the interior from the outside and then going back to the outside and saying what you've discovered. The math of general relativity explodes at that very single point at the center, what we call a singularity. And so we left from Einstein's perspective that a black hole is not a giant massive star that's many times bigger than the sun, but a black hole is empty space. Its mass is felt only as a distortion of space time. To the observer, the black hole is a pucker where mass once was a material that is now forever vanished from our ken. A black hole is effectively a belly button in the fabric of space-time. Now that could have just been a mathematical curiosity. But what we discovered in the 1950s and beyond was that um, a black holes and things like black holes appear to exist in our universe. And we started to discover objects such as quasars, such as pulsars, such as things that appear to be black holes themselves that could not be explained without the understanding that black holes were something that existed in the universe. The way we make a black hole is to take a massive star and to allow it to collapse and mass, particularly massive stars, nothing prevents their, their collapse. Once they run out of energy, they vanish, um, vanish to nothing. Um, the best black hole that we've seen so far is both the one at the center of our galaxy where we can see the stars orbiting around it and also this black hole that I'm showing now that is in the center of the galaxy M87. It's 55 million light years from Earth. It is um, about 8 billion times or billions of times the mass of the sun. And it's big enough so that with the world's most sensitive collaboration of radio telescopes, we can see the ga disk of gas and dust that um, sits around this black hole. And we can see just inside of, the, the inside of that donut hole is the black hole that we believe lies at the center of that galaxy. So black holes to scientists today have gone from being mathematical curiosities to things that are real and to things that exist. The other way general relativity has given us new ideas, has injected things into our head, is our view of the universe that begins with the Big Bang. And so I guess the question for you is, do you have a picture of what the Big Bang looks like in your head? Um, and does it involve everything in the universe running away from a single central point? So we take Einstein's equations and we say, let's say that the universe is the same at every direction in, in the sky and at every place in space. Now that's not true if we're being picky about it, but if we average the universe on very large scales, that does seem to be sort of true. The first hints of this came in 1917. It was worked out in detail in the 1920s. Uh, Friedman on the left is a Russian meteorologist. Um, he had an interesting life, he was a bit of a daredevil. Um, he at one point held the world record for going the highest in a balloon, and he died in 1925. He did the work that I'm going to talk about in 1923. On the right, we have George Lemaitre, a Belgian priest, um, a Jesuit scholar, taught in universities, um, lived to see his ideas accepted. 
They worked independently. They started from the same equations. And what they got was equations that said that the universe can grow or shrink, but that it can't stay the same size. Um, if it growing, it started growing at a finite time in the past. The density of the universe at that moment was infinite and with a few extra pinches of physical input, not only infinitely dense, but also infinitely hot. So we had hundreds or thousands of years to invent the idea of a Big Bang before Einstein. No one did. A few years after the invention of general relativity, the idea of the Big Bang was discovered independently by a couple of people following the same now fairly obvious lines of inquiry. Uh, the first evidence for this came from Hubble's work in 1929, where he showed that not only were there other galaxies in the universe, like our Milky Way, but that the more distant galaxies were moving away from us faster than those that were nearby, but that all galaxies appeared to be rushing away from the Earth. So um, this has been confirmed over the last 50 years to the point where cosmologists and astronomers are now almost as confident that the universe is expanding as a map maker would be that the Earth is, um, is round. And so what does that expansion mean? So general relativity is a theory that tells us how space and time are able to change. So the universe is expanding in general relativity, not because stuff is rushing into space from some central explosion, it's expanding because space is getting bigger. The contents of the universe are not moving in space. What is growing is the amount of space that lies between them. And so this allows us to answer a couple of questions, some big questions. Where did the Big Bang happen? Well, we've just assumed that every point is the same as every other point. Nothing's moving, so there can be no central point. And the answer to the question of where the Big Bang happened is that it happened everywhere. It happened where I'm sitting, happened where you're sitting, happened um, on the edge of the visible universe. Uh, what is the universe expanding into? Well, we don't need to worry about that either because we know that the universe is making up more space as it goes along. Um, so we don't need to supply any space for the universe to move into. In Newtonian physics, space doesn't change. The universe would be having to rush out into empty space that already existed. Will the universe expand forever? Well, that question isn't one that the math will answer. The math tells us it might expand forever might um, meet, your, meet your maximum size and recollapse. But observations tell us, observations tell us that the universe looks like it's set to expand forever. If we were to look at a distant galaxy and we were to come back a billion years later and look again, something we call dark energy, we don't know what it is, but we can see what it does. Um, something has caused, would have caused the speed that that galaxy is moving to increase. So not only is the universe expanding, it appear, appears that that expansion is picking up speed. Um, it allows us to answer the question of how old is the universe? We take some observations of the universe, the same ones that tell us how the universe expands. We feed it into the math of general relativity, and it tells us that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Not 13.1 billion years, not 14.2 billion years, but 13.8 billion years. So we're at a point where it seems that we can now measure the universe with a precision of a few percent. So once you understand how space-time behaves, you also pretty quickly understand and discover the idea of the Big Bang. An expanding universe is not something we imagined with Newton. We had 250 years to do it. 10 years after Einstein, two people had independently come up with the idea. By 1965, we were sure that this was the way that the universe worked. By 2015, 100 years after Einstein, we could measure its properties to within a few percent. So this is um, some questions, some answers about the way that we understand a dynamic universe um, and um, you know, with the understanding of space-time that general relativity gives us, some sense of how it is that a cosmologist or an astrophysicist um, looks at the sky. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll stop here. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, uh, thank you very much indeed, Richard. That was fantastic, as usual. And so... Everybody who's uh, listening in, now's your chance to ask Richard your questions. The question and answer box is accessible by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your uh, screen. Go ahead and do that. We've got some great questions coming in. Please add your own question. Take a look at the questions which have been asked already. If you see something that you like the look of and you like that answered, then do give it an upvote and that will bubble it to the top of our list.
There's no guarantee that we'll get through all the questions tonight because these sorts of talks usually raise a whole bunch of questions that we simply don't have time to go through it much as we'd like to. Um, so, but before uh, we get onto your questions, I have a few questions for Richard myself. So, you know, Newton came up with, it sounds like a pretty good explanation of the universe and how stuff works in it. But now we're saying that he was wrong. Was Newton wrong? Could I explain uh, no. wrong now? <laughs> So Newton, um, Newton had a set of ideas that were um, a huge step forwards. Um, you know, if you're an undergraduate physics student, you know, you buy a big book at the bookstore and probably about a third of that book um, is stuff that Newton did. And so what Einstein tells us is that there are certain sets of circumstances in which Newton's laws aren't enough. And we take the laws that Newton gave us and we lift them into the, into the language that Einstein supplies. And we find that there are subtleties that, um, that only become apparent really when you're able to consider electromagnetic phenomena, which were unknown to Newton, or when you're able to move at very large speeds again, which was something that Newton didn't have access to. There are no observations that Newton had made or that had been made in Newton's time that would have revealed the kind of the right questions to ask that would have taken you in the directions that Einstein went. So, I mean, wrong is, um, you know, physics grows and layers, um, you know, deepen our understanding of things. Um, so everything that Newton said is still true of the things that Newton was talking about, but Einstein gave us uh, um, you know, this deeper level of understanding. How sure are we that Einstein is, well, Einstein's theories are, is the end game, is, is where physics really is described perfectly? I think we're, we're actually sure that they're not, I think would be fair to say. Um, one thing we know is that everything else apart from gravity has a quantum mechanical description, all the other forces um, we haven't been able to find a quantum mechanical description of gravity. When we do, at some level, that will change our understanding. There are also possibilities that in very, very high energies, very, very intense gravitational fields, that we'll find out that Einstein's theories were not quite enough. It turns out that when we look at um, things like, we can look at merging black holes, and we can look at the, I haven't talked about gravitational waves, but the waves that they produce in space time, we have the opportunity to test general relativity under some of the most extreme conditions that we can imagine in the universe. All we know is that so far, there's nothing that we're looking at at the moment that seems to be, and there may be things that we need to look at, uh, the need for dark matter and dark energy in the universe may be telling us that we really don't understand gravity. So there may be problems that we're not thinking of as gravity problems, but are gravity problems. But certainly there's no, there's no kind of perihelion precession of Mercury, something that's been measured tested, reliable, can't think of another explanation um, that seems to be telling us there's something wrong just inside of Einstein itself. So what do we need to do to, to test these theories to their destruction, if you like? I mean, you, you made, the, you made <laughs> the claim that Einstein's almost certainly wrong, but it sounds like we just don't know. We, did, we haven't been able to disprove it yet. So what do we need to do? I think what we need to do, if we, I mean, the way to discover the next layer is to study material, um, study matter, study the universe in the most extreme conditions that we can imagine. And so part of that is looking back to understanding the mechanism of the Big Bang itself. Part of that is looking at um, black holes, um, the environment of black holes, what happens near them, uh, what happens when two black holes orbit each other, do, you know, do they exactly obey um, the criteria that Einstein laid down, um, you know, how far how far off um, you know, is, is, the, is the math and the measurement. At the moment, we haven't been able to find a gap, but the hope is that if, you know, if we drill down you know, greater and greater intensity, we'll start to, with something, something will break. And nothing makes a physicist happier than breaking a theory. And the older the theory is, the happier we are to break it. Uh, but so far, we haven't been able to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, here's a good question. Uh, and it's from me, and it's kind of it's kind of related to the statement that you threw in, in towards the end of your talk that as the universe expands, it's creating its own space as it goes along. Now, doesn't that take energy? And, and where does that energy come from to do that? Ooh, <laughs> um, it turns out it turns out it doesn't. It doesn't. So, so as you um, the one one of the way or the way in which Einstein reached his equations of general relativity is that he actually wanted the right-hand side of general relativity tells you where stuff is. You take a special kind of mathematical operation on the right-hand side and it vanishes, and that tells you that, um, that energy and momentum is conserved in the universe, that, that they can't change. Then, you know, this is one of the kind of bedrock understandings of physics. And then you look on the left-hand side, and that's a kind of piece that tells you about the geometry, 
And that's a piece, a combination of things that tell you about geometry that always have to vanish when you do the same operation. And so this was essentially by assuming that energy is conserved, that Einstein arrived at his theory of general relativity. So it has to conserve energy. The trick is to figure out how. Um, and how is energy conserved in the universe as it expands? And that, that turns out to be something that's a little tricky. But, you know, as the universe grows bigger and it's got regular matter inside of it, the expansion slows down. If there's not very much matter, the expansion continues forever. If there's a lot of matter, the expansion stops and the universe recontracts. When you put dark energy into the picture, it becomes, becomes more complicated. But it seems that we have a local understanding of energy conservation that is actually cooked into general relativity itself. So dark matter, dark energy, what, what's going on here? What, what, is this, what is this darkness that you speak of? Um, dark, to some extent, it's just branding. All it really means is that these things don't interact with light. So the, we, we look at the galaxy, the Milky Way, it seems like the stars in the galaxy are moving too fast for the galaxy to hold together on its own. Um, you know, so it looks like it should fly apart. There's two ways to explain that. One would be to say, well, we don't understand gravity, so we don't understand the rules of the game. We can see all the players. But we're pretty comfortable that we understand gravity. And so another way to say that is, well, maybe we just can't see everything that is in the galaxy. The extra stuff is dark matter. The dark energy is the stuff that drives the apparent acceleration of the universe. It's stuff that lives at every point in space. It's not necessarily something you can kind of bunch up together the way that dark matter can, but, um, but we don't know. Uh, we, we infer that it's there from the observations that we make in the universe, but we don't have any experimental observations or measurements that we've done on Earth that would allow us you know, that find new phenomena that wouldn't have the same explanation. It's a, it's a huge and ongoing challenge and opportunity for particle physics um, to come up with ways of testing different theories of dark matter and dark energy, but it's been a challenge. Speaking of challenges, now there's one, one image that you showed uh, in your talk, was here, and that was of, of light coming from a black hole, real light coming from a real black hole, a real image of a black hole, up until, as you mentioned in your talk, up until fairly recently, black holes were a, you know, astrophysicist's dream, you know, where we, we, we expect that they exist and we theorize they exist and we have, you know, observations that suggest they exist. Now we have this image of an actual black hole. And I just remember, I just remember the, um, the, the, the reaction of people when they saw it and they compared it to the sorts of images that they see in movies like Interstellar, the extraordinary <laughs> CGI. They go like, oh, is that what a black hole looks like? Well, it's not as good as the movies. <laughs> how do you feel? How do you, how do you, how do you react when, when people say, well, you know, it's not as good as the movies? When, in my mind, that was the most extraordinary image that we've received um, as a species. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, I remember like sometimes when you take someone into the backyard and you want a telescope set up and you show them Saturn um, through a telescope and then you know, Saturn has these, you know, these beautiful rings. But, you know, 50 years ago, that was, you know, that was an experience that showed you Saturn and you saw it with your own eyes. Um, but now you can compare that to the images that are returned by the Cassini spacecraft, for instance, that shows you, you know, close up pictures of the rings, you know, these, these kind of high res, high definition images. And so what we can see with our eye is never going to be as good as what we can see with a giant telescope or with the spacecraft. But I think with everything, there's something special about like it's there, you know, it's like you can look at the world's best picture of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but actually going there and seeing it for yourself, even on a cloudy, rainy day, you've still, you know, had that experience, had that, that real experience. And even that image, in some sense, is heavily processed. It's a radio image, so it's obviously, you know, it's been, um, the, it's light from different radio telescopes that was combined, light or radio waves from different radio telescopes. They were combined together in a computer years, you know, about a year after the data was taken. So it's not a real time image. You can't you know, look through a radio telescope, but still the sense that we've been able to make a prediction that we've been able to go into the sky and we're going to test it. The other cool thing about that image, in fact, is that it's the first one. And so it's a proof of concept. You make the telescopes better, um, various ways to tweak it and improve it. The, the image will get better along with it. All right. Well, moving on from Old to new, I guess, um, to questions coming in from our audience. Thank you very much indeed for everybody uh, sending in your questions. Do please keep them coming in. We're now going to turn to some of those. And uh, Karen Thompson asks a great question, which has garnered a lot of support from the community. If Einstein or Newton were around today, what would they be researching? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think um, Newton, you know, he was a very practical guy. I think um, Newton would probably be working on climate physics. 
Um, you know, he wanted to know how the world worked. He was, you know, deep and practical. Einstein, um, Einstein hated quantum mechanics. He always thought there was something wrong with it. Um, possibly he'd be still trying to pick holes in it. Um, he spent the last half of his life looking for a theory of everything. He didn't find it. He showed no sign of stopping. We're still looking. Possibly he'd still be in the trenches looking, looking for that. I, I you know, um, the, the, Newton, yeah, Newton was a, he was a, he was a gadgeteer. Einstein himself was, was not unpractical. He worked in a patent office. He invented a better kind of refrigerator. Um, he, you know, he was a tinkerer. Um, but, but my guess is yeah, Einstein wouldn't have stopped looking for the, for the, for the theory of everything. And Newton, uh, my guess would be working on climate. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, next question. What triggered the big bang? We don't know. <laughs> All right. There we go. <laughs> You did uh, say in your talk title some some answers. <laughs> some answers, yeah. Um, there's lots of there's lots of ideas about what might have done it. Usual answer is something to do with quantum mechanics, uh, which is one of the reasons why we think quantum theory and gravity might have something to do with each other. But we really don't know. That's that, that's that's you know the the last the last door of the mystery in some sense. All right. How about this one? Is our universe one of many? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, probably. Um, and nothing else, we can only see a finite patch of the universe. So if you travel in your mind far enough away from where we are, you're in a patch of space that we can't see. So to all intents and purposes, a different universe from ours. But also the question, you know, what triggered the Big Bang? We don't know. But we're not sure or most of the answers that we would have to be that, to that question are not things that only happen once. So I think the idea that the Big Bang happened more than once is not an unreasonable one. If I had to guess, I would say it's possible. Um, but that takes you in some sense beyond the edge of science because these are by definition not things that we can do observations that will test. If we knew the answer to the question of what triggered the Big Bang, then it's possible we would also learn the answer to the question of whether there are more universes than just, just one. All right, next question. I know you have the answer to this. Uh, what good does this research do for society? Can you talk about a practical impact? Okay, this is almost too easy. Is someone, is some, did, some, did we pay someone to, to, to set this one up? Um, so one of the ways that, um, that this uh, works is that when the first uh, GPS satellites were built, um, clocks run more slowly um, in deep in a gravitational field than they do outside of it. The GPS satellites are a fair way up in the sky. If we didn't know about that and we designed the GPS satellites accordingly, the clocks would be out by enough so that at the end of the day, GPS would be wrong by, by tens or maybe hundreds of meters. So the fact that your iPhone works, the fact that you have a satellite navigation thing that works in your car, uh, the fact that planes can find their way, you know, from one side of the world to the other. As long as you're actually doing GPS and you're not just kind of figuring out where you are relative to cell phone towers or something like that, you're, you're using, you're making use of general relativity when you do that. And in fact, the engineers who did it who were kind of cynical, they were saying, ah, this won't happen. Um, they actually designed the first GPS satellites um, so that they could turn this on and off. It turns out they needed it exactly. So if you wanted one clear answer about how general relativity gives us ideas about things, this would be it. Relativity in general, um, almost you know, fancy quantum mechanics, almost all needs um, the relativistic understanding of space time. Much, much of the world's economy sits on top of that. If we didn't have special relativity, most, most of what we think of as being fancy electronics in the world would vanish one way or another. Um, not because, you know, not, not, or at least if we didn't know it, we wouldn't be able to, um, to take advantage of it. Okay, um, here's a slightly controversial uh, question. How can high school teachers make physics more fun for students? And so much of the stuff that is really, quote, sexy, has to be built on top of classical mechanics. Now, I, I'm going to leave you to answer this one. I have my own reckons, uh, but this is, this is over to you. Uh, you know, I, I think in a sense, you know, when I was a student, I was kind of thinking, you know, I really want to do the cool stuff. You know, quantum mechanics, relativity, this is the stuff that's hard for us. But I think in some sense, the understanding, the, the, you know, I've come to realize that there's more to classical mechanics than met the eye. Um, and so I think, I think in some ways by telling students that if they do the classic, you know, you've got to, you've, you know, you got to do the boring thing before you can have the fun thing, you know, and classical mechanics is beautiful. It gives us, um, it gives us a sense of the way that the world works, everything from the flow of fluids 
um, is classical mechanics and a continuous media. Um, the way that planes behave, um, watching you know cars move, watching a ballerina dance, all of those things are classical mechanics. All of those things we can make sense of. The reason buildings stand up, um, you know, all of the reason a, a bird, the way that a bird flies through the air, all of those things relate um, ultimately to our understanding of classical mechanics. They go back go back to Newton, various add-ons. You know, how do I apply classical mechanics to fluids? How do I apply classical mechanics to to liquids? Um, but all of those things are classical mechanics, and so so much of the world uh, depends on an understanding of those things. Don't know if that helps. Um, this is sort Anyone, of a, whoever that is, you know, can, can come to me afterwards and we'll, we'll talk about this. If there was a good way to make physics more fun for, for students, I'd be all into hearing, hearing about it. I mean, speaking, you know, I think, I think one of the challenges is, is that physics is sometimes seen as slightly austere. Um, and that, you know, students who don't, um, you know, get physics to a certain level when they're in high school, that closes opportunities for them, uh, you know, later in life. And so, you know, both as someone who's, you know, passionate about sharing something that, that I love, you know, because it's, it's fun, um, but also in terms of, you know, like, like there, are, there are doors that are closed to you when you don't understand physics and mathematics. Not everybody may want to open those doors and go, th go through them, but those choices should be choices that people make, not choices that are made for them by the circumstances. Yeah, it's something I care a lot about. Happy to have a conversation offline with anyone about that. Uh, another question here. How can something come from nothing? When the law of entropy says things go from a higher to a lower energy state, now we might need to unpack that question a wee bit. Yeah, um, so, so one way that it can happen is you start off with a very, very tiny universe and quantum mechanics lets you cheat at some of these things. And so you can take a tiny universe and then you can expand it into something much larger. Entropy, um, like energy conservation, works a little bit differently in an expanding space time from the way that it works um, um, you know, in, in, in um, first year chemistry or, or high school. So it can. Um, gravity works, you know, gravity in the high entropy state and gravity is something that's collapsed and ordered. Um, so gravitation, the gravitational force works differently. Um, it's not like a teenager's bedroom where everything's kind of a high entropy state. It's all kind of scattered everywhere. The highest entropy state that a set of matter can have or a piece of matter can have is when you collapse it into a black hole. And so gravity collapses things, it brings things together. Um, you know, other forces tend to kind of strew things all over the place. So again, it's not that it doesn't, it's just that you have to have a somewhat more sophisticated understanding of entropy in order to make sense of what we're doing here. Here's a question. Uh, how does dark matter affect space-time? Uh, like any other matter, dark matter is stuff. It sits at a place. It has a gravitation and influence. You know, it contributes to the gravitational field. As far you know, the standard understanding of dark matter is we don't know what it is, but it behaves gravitationally like every other kind of stuff in the universe. All right, that was that was quickly dispensed with. How about this one? What was happening before the Big Bang? Oh, we don't know. <laughs> right, even faster. Um, okay. Uh, oh. Uh, hundred uh, so excuse me. About a hundred years on, we are about a hundred years on from Einstein's um, Annus Mirabilis. Beyond that, in fact, have we made any significant further discoveries on the subject? Um, in terms of gravity, um, gravity works the same way for us as it did for Einstein. We have the same equations; those equations haven't changed. What we have done is we've discovered new laws of nature. We've discovered nuclear physics, for instance, that that wasn't known in, in detail in 1915. Even the discovery of the nucleus itself, you know, was something that was happening around that point. Um, what we have done is discovered that gravity or the general relativity works in ways that we hadn't previously suspected. So the idea of the Big Bang, for instance, is something that grew out of that, our ability to test it, our ability to develop a narrative of the universe that seems to be accurate, sort of back to the Big Bang, is something that we've been doing over the last um, you know, 100 years, but something that's really pulled into focus you know, in the last 50, last 25, last, you know, last 10 years in some sense. So I think it's not, you know, our, our theory of general relativity is exactly the same as the one we had 100 years ago. Maybe not too depressing. We had 250 years of Newton. It takes us a long time to get, you know, these extra big ideas. And in, the, in that intervening time, we can do a huge amount of stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the discoveries that have been made, in particular, the discovery of gravitational waves that waves that themselves, because space-time can bend and stretch, these waves can move through space-time. And that's, you know, the ability to do that 
uh, first demonstrated almost exactly 100 years to the day after Einstein wrote down his theory. That's changing the way that we understand gravity, changing the way that, well, not we understand it, but certainly changing the way that we test it, giving us an opportunity to test what happens when these two black holes, you know, the two most extreme objects that we can imagine in general relativity, as they come together and merge and coalesce into one, and there's been no more, you know, those are the most violent events that have happened in the universe since the Big Bang itself. And we're now able to detect and, and measure those events and make sense of them. So not advances in the theory itself, but advances in our understanding and our ability to experimentally test the theory have taken us places I think that Einstein could never have dreamed of. Last question and apologies to everybody who I've not asked uh, your question. I'm sorry about that. Last question, because we've got to wrap it up now. Uh, what kind of work are you personally working on right now? Uh, personally, I work on what is dark matter made of? How do we sense, um, how do we test different theories of dark matter? I work on actually, uh, is there a multiverse? And also how does the universe evolve um, from the Big Bang uh, through to the present day in a way that we can make sense of and then test those ideas against experiments. Richard, thank you very much indeed for a fantastic talk. I um, hope everybody enjoyed listening uh, to the presentation. The questions were fantastic. It sounds like everybody's been thoroughly enjoying and engaged with uh, the, the material here. Minds have been expanded. This has been Raising the Bar Home Edition. Raising the Bar Home Edition has been a series of six speakers over six weeks. Today's speaker was Professor Richard Easter. The next speakers in the series will be Dr. Deb Shepard and Dr. Jamie Newth talking about impact investment. Please check the link on the closing slide if you'd like to join us in another talk. Thank you very much for joining us today, tonight, or whatever time it is where you are. We hope to see you again soon.